Salutations, my friends. Today I'm going to be talking about a subject that's a little different from my usual coverage of the Powerpuff reboot because today I'm actually going to be taking a look at the comic book series that was produced during the peak of the cartoon's run in 2016 and 2017. This has been an aspect of the series that I've been requested to look at by several people at this point, and it's also something I've been genuinely curious about for a few years now. I've really wanted to see how these comics compare to the animated series in terms of both quality and creativity, and I figure now is as good a time as any to give them a shot. Now, I'm no comics aficionado or anything like that. I definitely have an appreciation for the medium though. I think there's a lot of potential for interesting stories, and the entire concept of the layout alone is a great way to explore the art form. That portion by itself fascinates me. I seriously love the creative layouts that comic book artists can come up with to express and enhance the image they've developed on the page, and the coloring can be remarkably compelling when done properly. I have a lot of respect for comic book artists and illustrators out there, even if I may not familiarize myself with the medium as much as television, film, and games. Regardless, I've been excited to do a video on this subject for a while now because there's definitely something here worth checking out. And of course, I want to maximize my coverage of this show's existence as much as possible while I still can. That said, let's go ahead and dive into the Powerpuff Girls 2016 Reboot Comic Books. <laughs> So Powerpuff Girls 2016 ultimately witnessed three runs of comics, if that's what you want to call them. Issues 1 through 6, which ran from July 2016 to December 2016, a three-issue arc known as The Time Tie, which was released in May, June, and August of 2017, and the other three-issue arc known as The Bureau of Bad, which released the first two issues in November and December of 2017, followed by the third issue in January of 2018. In total, there were only 12 comic book issues issues released for the reboot under IDW Comics. It's also worth noting that all of these comics have the same writers as the actual show, and that should automatically give you an indication as to what you might be getting yourself into should you choose to give them a read. I don't intend to go through every individual comic and give you the whole spiel the way I do for episodes because honestly I could see most of these translating into episodes themselves and I really don't feel like making 12 episode reviews in one video. I'll give a brief overview, talk about what I do and don't like, and then leave the rest up to you to decide if they're worth your time or not. All of these comics have also featured the works of talented illustrators that have worked on previous comic runs, so there are some relatively experienced people that managed to contribute to this project. The most notable being Derek Charm, who took the helm for the first four issues as the main illustrator, and anyone who's familiar with other Cartoon Network and Powerpuff Girls comics such as Super Smash Up and Super Secret Crisis War will be able to recognize his work immediately. He's also known for working on the comic book series known as Jughead. I'd say bringing him onto this project was definitely a smart move because he was already familiar with the characters and had certainly proven himself. He's even done some interviews where he's expressed his interest and excitement getting to work on the reboot comics of the Powerpuff Girls. I think for the most part, his illustrations still managed to capture the look and feel of the reboot girls in his comics, and the chicken based designs he came up with for issue 2 specifically actually ended up working really well I feel because of their simplicity. Occasionally there is a character that ends up looking a bit off, such as the professor in certain panels, but I'd still say as a whole the comics look pretty decent for what they're going for. Obviously, don't expect a super detailed, hyper-realistic and gritty comic out of this. Powerpuff Girls 2016 is clearly going for a softer, lighter, kid-friendly sort of vibe with its comics, and I'd say it succeeds on that front, even if the characters do go off model sometimes. It's worth noting that after issue number four, Charm was preoccupied with other projects, and Nicoletta Baldari ended up doing the art for issue number five, who worked on some Friendship is Magic comics in the past. That was a one-and-done sort of deal, though, because then, Philip Murphy came on to do issue number six as well as the Time Tie and Bureau of Bad arcs, which I'll be getting to later. On top of the main illustrators, each comic featured subscription covers that were created by some seriously talented artists, as well as retail covers, each of which was drawn by an artist that has also worked on the television series. It's pretty easy to recognize the names if you're familiar with the show's staff like me. But now that I've established the background of these comics, perhaps it's time I get into what I think about each 
of them briefly. Issue number one. In this issue, the girls are watching the latest special on Space Tow Truck when Mojo somehow appears within the show itself, prompting the girls to get to the bottom of this mystery. Alas, it seems that even in the comic books, next we get a montage of Mojo going through other popular television series parodies such as General Hospital, Wheel of Fortune, and 60 Minutes. Later, the girls arrive at the mayor's office to discover that he's giving Mojo an award for being such an incredible actor, and Mojo humbly accepts this while his paparazzi following blinds the girls. This is where we find Mojo has a doomsday device that is somehow powered by movie awards, which will allow him to destroy the city. Okay, I don't see why he wouldn't just make a regular device, but okay. And the last award he needs is the Golden Glob, which he easily wins and uses to start up his device, although the Powerpuff Girls are able to defeat him at the end and save the day. My overall stance on this one is pretty mixed. I think it's interesting to see Space Tow Truck talk when that vehicle has never been given a voice whatsoever in all 120 episodes of the reboot, but even in the comics, Mojo still speaks using his third person dialect rather than the Mo Linguish that everybody knows and loves. There's also an error at one point where Mojo says the mayor's award is his fourth, yet the machine shows that he's won five. And honestly, the ending is hard to comprehend because the comic obscures how Mojo is being defeated. I guess the girls are ruining his clothes and that's somehow tarnishing his image, but that has no impact on the power of the doomsday device. Mojo literally turns the thing on using all six awards and then there's no resolution after that and the girls never acknowledge it again. I mean, it's not like the device would just vanish out of existence or anything, I thought that was the whole threat here. It's also peculiar how the girls ruin his image directly in front of the audience where they can see the girls doing this too him, yet they still turn on Mojo and treat him like he's at fault anyways, even though his paparazzi clearly listened to everything he did and thought he could do no wrong. It all just feels forced. Overall, I like that Mojo has an evil scheme, but this is just a Mac comic all things considered. As a first issue, it failed to really pull me in. If I were just a casual reader looking for something to try, I would have given up after this issue, truth be told. I don't think it's a bad first attempt at a comic, but it's definitely not the best one that's been made by a long shot. Issue two is about the girls being challenged by this strange movie director, Harold Richter, who says they're too chicken to watch his movie in order to instigate the girls into wanting to prove themselves that they are brave enough to handle it. The professor tries to stop them, but they easily ignore his advice and head to the theater where the director enacts his evil plan and turns the girls into chickens just by having them watch the film. He then reveals that his plan is to start an omelet restaurant and he wants to enslave the people of Townsville as chickens so he can get his egg supply for free. Instead of capturing the girls, however, he sets them free and they run back home where the professor says he can't do anything to help them, so they rush back to the theater and beat him up. This one is certainly weird to say the least, but I will say I do like the chicken designs of the girls, as I mentioned earlier. They translated really well from their regular reboot designs. This episode also has a special appearance made by Taco Cat, the band responsible for producing the main theme song to the Powerpuff Girls reboot. It's just a brief cameo and nothing more, but still super cool to see them appear in it nonetheless. I will also say that the concept of zombie mimes acting as the opener was pretty clever wordplay. You'll never hear them coming is a pretty good tagline for that. The only thing I really don't enjoy is the fact that the director just lets the girls go instead of them escaping from his grasp. He'd have been more threatening if he kept the girls captive and they had to escape before he cooked them alive or something. It would have also made their trip back home to the professor feel less redundant and pointless. The structure of the comic is literally go to the theater, go home just for the professor to do nothing, then go back to the theater. It feels redundant, but that's just me. The next issue features Donnie, except he's actually decently tolerable now that we don't have to hear his voice. He's also not a completely incompetent buffoon in this comic either. Instead, he simply doesn't have any money to buy a real badminton racket, so he's stuck using a waffle on a stick in its place. The main premise of the comic is that Donnie needs to find a job so he can afford to buy a real racket, so he tries getting one at the Waffle House, but they deny him because Sasquatch ruined the reputation of all fairy tale creatures. In comes Prince Princess, who hires him as her bodyguard so that she can use his magic powers to get what she wants, as we see in another panel montage of Donnie ruining a child's birthday party. 
The girls obviously catch wind of this and warn Donnie, but he tells them that they don't know Princess like he does in a similar vein to the whole Chelsea scenario from Odd Bubbles Out, and after a short falling out, he and Princess work together to raid the Powerpuff Girls house for... Chemical X? In Powerpuff Girls 2016? What madness is this? Nah, in all seriousness, it just makes me wonder even more why the show never acknowledged its existence if it was able to appear in the comic, you know? Bliss notwithstanding. Oh, and then the comic ends with Donnie doing a quick 180 and siding with the girls while they beat up a waffle monster that was born when the chemicals spilled on it. Yeah, the ending is pretty weak, and if you hate Odd Bubbles Out, you probably won't enjoy this comic either, aside from the fact that at least Bubbles isn't a jerk in this one. Donnie's change of mind would make more sense if he actually saw the girls suffering as a consequence of his actions instead of just flipping on a whim. Also, the Powerpuff Girls have after-school jobs apparently despite being six years old, so I guess the comic forgot who its characters were for a panel there. Not really a fan of this one, but it's not the worst of the bunch either, although pretty darn close. I will say though, Donnie really does put the bad in badminton. Comic number four. Apparently the Powerpuff Girls never learned how to ride a bike, which under normal circumstances isn't a problem because they can fly everywhere they go, but in this story the mayor is asking the girls to lead the Tour de Townsville charity event. No matter what the girls try, they can't get it down, but I think that's understandable given their stubby little legs. That is, until Penny Farthing shows up to strike a deal with them. They trade Penny their ability to fly, and he gives them the ability to ride a bike. They agree to this deal, and then him reveals himself in a manner that most would probably see coming, seeing as all the reboot can come up with for him to do is make deals with the girls and nothing else. Also, the fact that he is right there on the cover. Him figures now that the girls can't fly, he can destroy Townsville and proceeds to do just that. Meanwhile, the professor teaches the girls to ride their bikes, and then they go back and defeat him, even though they gained the ability to ride their bikes. My immediate question was, why couldn't the girls just fly to lead the pack instead of riding bikes themselves? I mean, I get that it's a bicycle event, but the girls flying would still serve the same function in the same way. The biggest disappointment for me, though, is the obvious fact that while the cover looks great, it spoils that him is the villain. Not that that's super hard to see coming, but it still spoils it nonetheless, so a younger viewer who might not have seen it coming just had it ruined for them. The moment of the girls learning to ride their bikes is adorable, especially Bubbles' lion betrayal line to the professor. Him's havoc wreaking is also cool, although I think the jokes about him taking a class at the Townsville Learning Annex are very similar to the reboot's bad habit of forcing a running gag. Also doesn't make sense because him has been established to talk in other voices in the show, but hey. I'm glad that the comic acknowledges that him can already fly, but that's not a concern of his because really he just wanted to make it so the girls couldn't, so I appreciate that aspect. Only major complaint is that the girls get their flight back by pedaling backwards on their bicycle, which makes absolutely zero sense. It's a total cop-out that tells me the comic thought it wrote itself into a corner, but it didn't. The girls made the deal with him, and it was to only last for a day. It's explicitly stated in the comic, so I don't see why that panel couldn't just be a transition to the next day showing that the girls can fly again. I don't know, I feel like this is an obvious oversight, considering that the comic established that the girls would get their powers back eventually, and then it came up with another lame excuse to get them back sooner, even though it doesn't make any sense, but whatever. Anyways, I'd still say this is on the upper end of quality. Following this comes issue 5, which is my personal favorite of the first six issues. This comic features Bubbles entering a derby with Blossom and Buttercup as her pit crew, while hilarity ensues. It's possible this later served as the inspiration for Total Eclipse of the Card in Season 3. I'm not sure. As I said, this was made by the same team, so I'd say it's possible. The comic takes a different turn, however, when Mojo sabotages Bubbles' go-kart and causes it to go faster and faster until it is driving so fast around Townsville that it creates one big drain. It is then up to Blossom and Buttercup to sneak into Mojo's lab and acquire the remote to turn the vehicle off to save Bubbles and the town from utter annihilation. I never expected to see a Game of Thrones reference in the Powerpuff Girls reboot, but sure enough, one managed to work its way in there. Also, I find that Mojo's plan is a perfect fit for him. It's destructive enough to where there's some real consequence, but it's also cartoony and silly enough that it allows his wackier side to shine. His disguise when he goes to sabotage Bubbles' cart is also pretty amusing, and yeah, overall, I definitely recommend this one. I've avoided talking about most of it because I really do implore you to consider checking this one out for yourself. If not any others from the first six issues, definitely issue number five. And last but not least, well, 
actually, yeah, it is my least favorite, is the final issue, which is a story about Bianca and Barbaras using their sassy bazooka to make the girls sassy and allow them to get away with crimes because the girls are too busy ruining their relationships with everyone. This felt like a whole lot of nothing happened because the girls just become sassy, say a few rude things in front of Townsville citizens and the professor, and then go and kick the fashionistas' butts. Not nearly as exciting as the previous issues I had covered. I don't have much more to say about this one either. It's easily the worst of the comics. In fact, if I were to rank them, I'd probably list them as follows. These six issues were later combined into two three-issue compilations titled Homecoming for the first three and Power Up My Mojo for the last three. Now, given the premises of the six issues I just described, I'm sure you can see why I fail to see how these subtitles reflect the actual content contained within said compilations, but then again, the comics aren't given titles anyways, which is why I've had to refer to them as issue number one through issue number six for the entire video thus far. Then again, considering how awful the titles were for episodes in the show, maybe that's a blessing in disguise. Either way, it's still a little weird. I'm uncertain as to whether or not the original run only going for six issues was intended or not. The major reason being the fact that issue number six ends with the same until next month bubble that was present on the previous comics, yet that mysterious seventh issue never came. Was it due to the lack of popularity in the reboot comics? Well, I'm not entirely sure. I'm kind of inclined to believe it's because the three issue arcs were later released as their own things rather than being tied to the original six issues. Maybe IDW wasn't interested in continuing the main run, so they settled on those mini arcs instead. Maybe the creative team decided that instead of releasing the time tie as one issue, it was better suited to expanding into three which may have caused it to divert from the project. I'm honestly not sure, and I haven't found a verified reason online, but what I can say is that the time tie is very substantial. I genuinely like it. This here is the first of the three issue arcs that were released for the reboot comics, centering around each of the three Powerpuff Girls getting warped to a different time period when Mojo's magical time tie sends them packing during a New Year's Eve celebration. In terms of overall concept, it's nothing special, but I will say it manages to get time travel right, which isn't something you can usually say about most media. However, the logic of time travel usually isn't a major priority of mine in the grand scheme of things so long as the execution makes up for it, and in this case, I'd say it does pretty well. I could honestly see this being a genuine multi-part special in a similar vein to something like Small World. I think each of these three issues is very substantial for an 11 minute cartoon episode, and I honestly didn't mind most of the jokes. Most of them. The first of the three issues focuses on Blossom being sent to the Wild West, where a lot of the comic's rules get established through her exposition with this train passenger. It's there where she explains how she and her sisters got transported away and how they need to find a chromo gem in order to get transported back to the present. It also turns out this passenger has the very chromo gem that Blossom needs, but it ends up getting stolen when Kitty the Kid and her bandit grunts show up to raid the train. This in turn causes Blossom to challenge her to a duel after wrangling up her two thugs, and they agree to fight each other in a classical western style duel except without actual guns. I will say that on the whole, this specific issue is a much more enjoyable take on the Powerpuff Girls in a western setting than West in Pieces was from the original, largely thanks to the fact that this isn't slow, drawn out, or painfully uninteresting. I also like the little nod to Blossom's Jigglypuff watch, the same one that was seen during the opening of Daylight Savings. The granny character from the original also makes an appearance at one point too. I do have a few issues though, namely with the physics of how a bomb somehow sends Blossom rocketing straight upward while not affecting anybody else on the train or causing collateral damage for that matter. I think one of those boxes with a boxing glove in it would have made more sense if I'm being honest. The ending overall is sweet however, and I definitely enjoy seeing passengers Blossom spent some time with getting to grow and take on a new role going forward now that Blossom helped save their town. As for Bubbles, she ends up getting transported to the Caribbean and has somehow banded together a crew of pirates to help her go around searching for her chromo gem. I'll say right away that this is my favorite of the three stories if only because Bubbles' silliness juxtaposed to the seriousness of pirate life really allows her to shine. She usually does when faced with serious situations because of her overly optimistic point of view. In this issue, she comes across Neckbeard the pirate who has a map to a treasure chest that contains the chromo gem. 
gem, so Bubbles and her crew give chase after him in order to get her back to her own time. They end up getting stopped by a kraken, but after making friends with a giant crab monster the following morning that also happens to be the kraken's sibling, they manage to find Neckbeard and defeat him so Bubbles can get back to the present day. A nice continuity detail present in this issue is the fact that Bubbles ends up staining her shirt with ice cream early on, and that stain ends up staying on her for the entire issue, all the way up until she's transported through the portal. That's consistency that we could only wish was present in the actual show. There's also another continuity nod where Bubbles suggests the pirates rename their location from Townsville to Fish Stench Cove and move it to the Wild West, which is a reference to the part in Blossom's comic where she learns that the town was named Fish Stench Cove despite it not making any sense whatsoever. Great way to tie the comics together a bit more and play with the whole time travel concept. Blossom unknowingly undoes Bubbles' call to action. Neckbeard is also a great name for a pirate, considering how he acts, and what's also great is how Bubbles literally just uses her laser eyes to solve the problem instantly, instead of being a total doofus the way the girls usually are in the animated series. Seriously, it is astounding to see the comics actually portray the Powerpuff Girls more like themselves, and it shows how the network executives tampering with the cartoon severely impacted its quality. I'm led to believe there were less restrictions with the comic book relative to the show, but who knows? Maybe Bubbles' shirt stain was Murphy going the extra mile or something. I don't know. Lastly, there is Buttercup's issue, which pits her in a Jane Austen-like time period where she has to help this fancy, prestigious woman get over Mr. Dandy, a fancy man that is trying to marry her in order to steal her riches. In some ways, I'd say this is Once Upon a Townsville done right, because it actually gets the message across through its portrayal of Dandy and allows Duchess Calpurnia, that's her name by the way, to see through his awful behaviors and not fall for his tricks while simultaneously thanking Buttercup for helping her see the error of her way. I like that Buttercup shows her her narrow mindset, and Calpurnia willingly listens to that criticism. Unlike Bluebell, who chastises the girls for preventing her from killing herself, but I'm not going on about that again. I wouldn't say this era is as exciting as the other two, but it's focused more on the characters rather than the setting this time around, and I think that helped it immensely. In the end, all three girls get their respective chroma gems and whisk back to the present day, which, might I add, is another brilliant aspect of time travel being done right, because the girls return to the exact point in time Mojo sent them away, meaning no time actually passed at all in the present day, because the girls had the ability to decide what time they wanted to return, and Mojo's evil plan was rendered ultimately useless because he didn't think this through. Like I said, time travel rarely ends up being executed correctly, but the fact that this comic actually got it right said Sets it up a notch in my book. Compared to the first six issues, the time tie did impress me in ways I was not expecting. I truly did enjoy this read and kinda wished we got it as a multi-part special for the series instead of The Power of Four or Small World. I think this story beats both of those out easily. At the same time though, had this been produced for the animated series, would it have been as enjoyable or would the show have forced things a little too much and ultimately hampered the experience? I'm not sure, but I am satisfied with the comic that we got and it definitely gets a recommendation from me. Now, as for the Bureau of Bad, this one I'm a little iffy on, and here's why. The comic book relies on references to the old series galore. Billboards are present in so much as the first panel featuring Samurai Jack, Major Glory, and the talking dog one from Uh-Oh Dynamo. Mojo then makes his way into what is known as the Doom Room, a villain hideout where all of Townsville's villains gather together in order to hash out their latest schemes. You got the fashionistas, princess, him, and a bunch of cameos made by Ace of the Gang Green Gang, looking more like his original self I might add, Femme Fatale, Fuzzy Lumpkins, and even Sedusa, surprisingly. The thing is though, they don't do anything. Yeah, it's cool to see the villains present in the room, but barely any of them talk throughout the entire comic. We've got 72 pages, and yet it's only like three of the main villains of the story and a few one-off new guys. Him doesn't even have a say in anything going on, it's just the Princess Mojo and Fashionistas show. Or comic. 
Not that I don't like Butterfingers or Garbage Gary. In fact, I think the latter is actually pretty funny in the way he intrudes on the scene, but it's the same situation as the Rowdy Rough Boys in Total Eclipse of the Cart. They don't actually do anything, so just seeing them present has very little significance and ultimately feels shallow. Like, yeah, it's cool, but I want to see these villains do things. That's their whole appeal. It's the same principles as what I talked about in my video on the CN City era and how those bumpers were dragged drastically better than all of the eras after it. I like that the balloonfish monster is destroying the city again because that is right at home in the Powerpuff Girls. I just wish that all of the other characters would do more than just stand around. There are also other references to things like the Flintstones and Lucky Captain Rabbit King Nuggets as they appeared in the original, but anyways, the first issue focuses on Princess buying the Powerpuff Girls name so that she and her crew are now legally recognized as the PPGs while the original girls go around under the new name of Nobody. I think that Princess's plan is substantial and well suited for her character in a unique way the original series hadn't done. She would be the type to buy their name legally in order to take away their reputation and it doesn't work out for her as one would expect. I even love the newspaper gag that happens in the middle of the comic. The whole premise that leads to Princess telling this story is that the Bureau of Bad can't decide on a leader, even though we all know it should probably be him or Mojo given their statuses compared to all of the other villains, but hey, what do I know? I'm at least glad there's some real action present in these comics though, that is a definite plus. The second issue is about Bianca and Barbarous kidnapping the professor and forcing him to make indestructible clothes, which I feel is fitting because he did the same thing in Take Your Kids to Doomsday, and it's a shame there's no callback to that episode because this would have been a great opportunity to tie these together. As I said though, Garbage Gary's interruptions I find are actually kinda humorous compared to other times in the show where this exact same gag would happen, like Bubbles saying she had to go to the bathroom in the last Donnycorn for instance. With Garbage Gary, I feel the execution comes across a lot better. The professor still sucks though. The only reason he does this is because Barbarous persuades him, but we the audience never find out what that reasoning is. Issue number three then tells of Mojo growing a tail and beating the girls in outer space, where they meet Gull Cactus, who goes to Townsville and starts eating everything until the girls stop him, and then that's the end of the issue. I don't really like this one as much as the time tie personally, even though I could see why others would. I'm just more impressed with the previous arc than this one is all. It isn't bad, but it didn't impress me just because it had a bunch of references to the old show. I really did not care about the fashionista story at all, and Mojo's was just kind of forgettable. Princess's story was really the only one that stuck out to me, and I definitely enjoyed that part, but compared to the time tie where I enjoyed all three issues, it's easy for me to say this is the inferior of the two. If anything, this just feels like a compilation of three regular episodes of the show, or three regular comics. In fact, I kind of wish these were episodes of the reboot because then we'd have gotten two decent-ish episodes out of it that I'd gladly replace with something like Quarantine or Largo. But anyhow, that about does it for my coverage of the Powerpuff Girls reboot comics in this video. As I said, there are definitely some issues out here worth checking out, so I hope some of you decide to take the time to give them a shot for yourselves. I definitely don't regret checking these out. I can say that much for sure. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this little bonus video on an outside aspect of the Powerpuff Girls 2016 media franchise. I have a few more coming out on the way, so definitely be on the lookout for those. I'm really excited to put those videos out. With that said though, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next bonus video.